One, you walk on eggshells. We all know what that's like, right? That's enough said. Walking on eggshells, you feel like you can say nothing right and anything you say could set off the other person in a direction that is not exactly positive. Number two, you're confused by any conflict because it feels, what did I say here? It feels like your reality is being twisted. So you're being gaslighted, right? You feel like you are always, you don't know what's right or wrong. You don't know what you argued about. You don't even remember how you feel about something because what you've been told you feel is wrong. Or, and you feel manipulated into feeling sorry for the other person. You're confused by any conflict. You're required or you have the need to constantly be checking in with the other person, to constantly be telling them where you are. If you're five minutes late, if you're 10 minutes late, whatever it is, constantly having to let them know what's going on or else. Not out of polite courtesy, I'm gonna be a few minutes late, but you feel like if you don't do that, something bad is gonna happen. There's, there's like a sense of dread when you, and you're checking in very anxiously. Number four, you feel, you feel sad when your partner cracks jokes because they feel like a tax. So you, you kind of, your sense of humor gets warped and maybe you don't even really have one anymore. I know I completely lost my sense of humor, if you can believe it completely gone, didn't laugh for years. So yeah, grumpy girl. So out of character behavior with your humor and your moods, right? So you, so jokes feel like a tax and you can't tell if you're being too sensitive or there, they are a tax. Just something feels off with, with any, any joke coming at you from your partner and you feel like the humor in the relationship is something's wrong with it. All right, number five, you apologize when you've done nothing wrong. When you are completely clear, not saying that you always think you did nothing wrong, saying that you're thinking about it, you're going, what did I even do? How did, how did that turn into that? But you still find yourself apologizing for the, for, for the unknown thing. Number six, you are constantly trying to fix things because there feels like there's a, like, it feels like your partner shuts down and then comes back. There's hot and cold something going on and you don't understand it. And so you think it's you and you're trying to fix it. Maybe you see it's them, but often, at least in the beginning, when we first have this happen, because it comes after when the devaluing starts, which we're so used to the love bombing that by then it's confusing and it feels like it's our fault, right? So you are trying to fix things to make that, make that warm come back because the cold it was clearly something you've done, right? So, or or you just notice the hot and cold behavior and you don't, it's confusing and you don't know what to do with it. All right, or frustrating or annoying. It can be all kinds of feelings you have when you notice hot and cold behavior. All right, you apologize even if you aren't wrong just to keep the peace. Yep, that too, just to keep the peace. All right, number seven, there's a hypervigilance over the emotional state of the other person. You are constantly trying to manage the world around them so that they don't have a tantrum. You're constantly trying to manage the world around them so they're happy and content so that they aren't lashing out at you. That, the fix it syndrome, right? Um, so, and this is also part of the fix it syndrome, right? We're, we're having to manage the, if you're managing your relationship, not in a relating relationship, something's off regardless of abuse. So you're having to manage down things and you're having to manage well, basically, you're constantly having to think about and consider the emotional state of another person. And I'm not saying that we should always be considering the emotional state of our partner. Not in that way. Consider, be concerned about, be anxious over, be worried about, and then trying to manage and fix the other person's emotional state because something bad will happen. Number eight, you feel like your partner um, is not seeing any good in you at all. And belittles your accomplishments. So this is, you know, part of the devaluing. You feel like you feel like no matter how hard you try, you're not enough and what you're doing isn't good enough. Number nine, you feel like, okay, with sex, you feel like um, you're having sex against your will or pressured into doing things that cross your boundaries in a sexual way. Um, or number 10, so you're made to feel dirty or wrong for wanting sex when they are withholding and they're withholding on purpose. It's all about control with them, right? And sex. So 
if it's not a romantic partnership, maybe it's something else where they're trying to control you, but you're made to feel wrong for wanting affection. Another sexual one, you have lost any communication or connection. In, in other words, you're dissociating when you are intimate. There's a lot of dissociation going on. Now this can happen for personal reasons too, but this is all in conjunction with other things. So if one of these things is happening, it can happen. But if lots of these things are happening, something is off in the relationship, okay? All right, number 11, or number 12 rather. You seem kind of spacey and, and dissociated when there's any stress. Of course, that can happen to anyone with PTSD or anyone with whose um, nervous system is wound up or who's anxious or, you know, but with everything else in combination, you feel like you just can't handle any stress and you just dissociate from it. All right. Number 13, you are making excuses. This is a big one. And we do it all the way through the trauma bonds. And we do it. This is the last thing people let go of sometimes in order to heal. We have to let this piece go. And it can be one of the harder ones. You're making excuses, excuses and rationalizing um, the abusive behavior. Making excuses for the toxic person and rationalizing their abusive behavior. Um, we are empathic people usually, and we can see other people's pain. We listen to what they say. We know their stories and we feel for their stories. And so, of course, there's a reason they're acting the way they're acting. There's never an excuse for it. But there's some sort of rationalization that goes on there that keeps us in a state of cognitive dissonance. So when you're doing that, you're in a state of cognitive dissonance and you're in a state of, um, well, you're trapped in trauma bonding. Number 14, you dread holidays or plans because of the fear of sabotage. Yeah, you dread doing anything or planning anything, going anywhere. Number 15, you feel like your insecurities are being used against you. You feel like your vulnerabilities that you've exposed to this person are being used against you. All right, you become afraid to share who you are because of this. Number 16, you are desperately trying to get the old way of the relationship back. You're desperately trying to get it back to the beginning, to get it back to when it felt nice, when everything was wonderful. You're trying to bring the love bombing back and you're in desperately trying, you feel like it's your fault that it's not there. Number 17, you are soothing the abuser after mistreatment. So you are the one fawning and soothing and calming the waters after the person mistreats you. Number 18, you can't talk about issues within the relationship. You cannot bring up an issue, even a tiny one, even a teeny tiny issue. You can't say anything that's an issue within the relationship without it backfiring, without it becoming a huge issue, without being gaslit, without being having projection thrown all over you. You're not heard and you can't resolve anything. So everything feels unresolved. I think one of the major reasons that we, we leave toxic relationships with narcissistic people and we feel the lack of closure is because of this. It's because we've spent years, months, years, often, years and years and years often, never being able to discuss or have a, have a rational and useful conversation or a, um, a conversation that leads to anything mutually discussed, right? There's never closure. We don't have closure from day one with any conflict, any just any dispute, any debate, any difference ever. So yeah, it's really hard to find uh, closure at the end when there's never closure within the relationship, okay? So really what we're basically saying is it ended the way it's gone. And we need to find closure in that. We need to find closure elsewhere. That's another topic. You feel like the conversation is shut down and you are unheard. So you feel like you'll have conversations and, and you're never heard. You feel in your life like no one hears you. Let's put it that way. It starts to get where it, it bleeds out into everything. You feel like no one hears you at a certain point. If you've had this long enough, you feel like you're never heard. So many people will come for coaching and I see it more in group coaching because there's more of a dynamic there where 
people don't feel heard by one another, even though I can see they're being heard. And it, it it's very hurtful to the person. And it's it's a really tricky one because we're just never been heard. If you had narcissistic parents and you had a narcissistic narcissistic partner, you've never been heard. And so to be heard to you, you don't even, I mean, you may know what it is, but it's the concept of having it coming towards you is completely foreign and you have to learn what being heard is. Number 21, you feel like you're being treated nicer when you're out in public or with a group of people or with friends. And like, it's a totally, you, you don't understand, you feel confused why that, why you're not treated the same way at home. At home, you're treated aloof, rudely, um, cruelly, ignored, things like that. Uh, you're, you're being abused in private, you're being gushed over and fawned over and, and um, love bombed in public. You're begging them to talk or you're fawning them to end the silence. So you're going around apologizing, begging, bringing cups of tea, you know, you're doing, you're, you're making dinner, you're doing all the things to make them stop being silent. You feel like you are too sensitive. You feel like if something's wrong with you because you're just too sensitive and you should be able to take it and you're just, yeah, okay. We all know how that is. Number 24, you can't express your true feelings. Because if you do, you feel like you're worried, you're scared, you're, you know you'll be belittled, minimized, ignored, or neglected. Those feelings will be, or twisted around and told they're wrong, okay? So you feel like you can't express yourself. You can't be yourself. What I'm getting at here, you can't be yourself when you're with a toxic person. Everything changes to manage that relationship. If you're managing your relationship and you are no longer yourself, regardless of whether it's toxic, it's something to look at. Number 25, you are jealous and you have never been jealous in your life before, or maybe minimally, like a little like, oh, you know, a little jealous, but you are seriously jealous. You are feeling like they're looking at everybody else like this is, you're, you feel crazy when you're not used to feeling that and you suddenly do. You feel like something's wrong with you. All right. You feel like you're being compared all the time. Like you feel judged and oh, big time. You feel judged and you feel like you're being like, and this carries over too for a lot of survivors that they feel like everyone is judging them and everyone is comparing them to everybody else. And they're not worth this ties into your self-worth, your sense of self, your sense of belonging, all of that. So you feel compared. You're cut off and isolating. You're cut off and isolated or you're cut off and isolating. Either you feel like the person isn't allowing, well, they aren't allowing you to have a life, uh, but you are isolated from your friends and family. You are isolated. You're, they hate your sister. Nothing's wrong with your sister, but they hate that sister. So you can't be around that sister or talk to that sister or about that sister. So you've just been cut off from one source of support and love in your life. So if you are feeling like you are in a soul relationship with one person and there are no other people involved in your life, something's off there. You're, you're having to play yourself down so you're not making the other person have to feel so jealous. Eight, you are constantly protecting their ego. Somebody might say, yeah, I know how they are. And you say, oh no, they're fine. They just have, you know, you're again, rationalizing and making excuses, but it's literally to protect their ego. Number 29, you feel totally and solely responsible for making things good in the relationship. You may want them to fix certain things about themselves, but ultimately it's on you. You're the one, you feel you're the one that can make things better. Just a little more love, just a little more understanding. I'm not being this enough. I'm not being that enough. If I would change this, how many of us, how many of you have spent a few months, a year, a couple years, doing your own therapy, researching what's wrong with you, looking into things that you could be doing in the relationship, wondering, um, seeing that you're codependent or that you are behaving in people-pleasing ways, let's put it that way, seeing that you're people-pleasing, looking up ways to heal codependency, people-pleasing behaviors, blah, 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 thinking that if you just changed you and put in the work for you, that it would fix the relationship. How many of you looked up attachment theory, adult attachment theory? 
uh -huh, and thought, oh, I'm an anxious attached. Well, no wonder I'm pushing them away. Anyone would push away from that, you know? So that's a sign that something's up. When it when both people aren't working to resolve their own personal stuff, then something's going on, right? At number 30, you're feeling like you are the abuser. You're told you have the qualities that the abuser possesses. You're being projected upon and you believe it. You question it. Uh, maybe they don't use the words like Luna said, you're a sociopath. Maybe they don't use the words, but they're, they're describing the behaviors and projecting it onto you. And you believe it. You, you start looking up different things that you could be because you're being told you're those things. You feel like within the relationship that you're in, you're just not enough. Number 34, um, everything feels like a com competition with them. Hey, want to learn to whatever together? Want to learn to play guitar? It's a competition. Hey, I had this thing happen to me. Well, I had that thing happen to me. There's the competition. Everything's a competition with them. Okay, number 35. Things you love, you hate doing with them. Perhaps you love hiking. Suddenly, you don't even want to go hiking. You don't want to go with them. You don't want to do it with them because they destroy it. Okay. And it makes you hate the things you love. You, our brains associate it with, I suddenly don't like that thing when really it's, I don't like it with them because they're toxic to me when we're doing the thing. You are afraid of making decisions on your own. You no longer can. Maybe you were a very decisive person. Maybe you had an executive job and you made decisions all the time. And suddenly you can't even choose what to eat. All right. Making decisions, not being able to make decisions is part of you know, PTSD from toxic abuse, but it had, starts within the relationship because you can't make decisions around them because they're the wrong choice because everything you do is wrong, right? You cannot identify your boundaries because you don't know where they are because they have been pushed so far, at least within the relationship. You cannot identify your boundaries. You don't even know you have one, have them. You don't even know what that means maybe, okay? Um, number 38. You feel responsible for their emotional states. Okay, number 39, you can't pursue your own dreams. Every time you try and do something that is for you, something you love, every time you try and go to work, every time you try and like say you got to work overtime, but it's a project you really want to work on, they will sabotage you, okay? Every time you try to pursue your dreams, they'll encourage you with smiles on their faces to just, you're so great. You're such a great photographer. You should go do that more. And the second you have a gig to go shoot the photographs, they are sick in bed and need you. They are this, they are that. They're pulling at you to stay with them. They're not letting you move. They're not letting you do anything or they're belittling you or they're saying that's stupid, you and your stupid hobby, you know. So they will sometimes build you up and then yank the rug out from under you. And other times it's completely sabotage the thing you're trying to do. The big one, the big number 40, you lost yourself. You no longer have a sense of who you are. You don't know who you are. You just, you think, maybe you think this is me. And when you look at it, you know, wait a minute, all I'm doing is serving this other person's life. You don't do anything in service to yourself. And you can still be in service to other people in your life and yourself at the same time. And you've lost that. If you need any help with anything regarding coaching or group coaching, check out the information in the main description of every video I'm available around. If you need any, have any questions, you can email me coachlisec, C-O-A-C-H-L-I-S-E-C at gmail.com.